it creates an interesting vibe. Oh, it's being recorded. There we go. <laughs> yeah, attendees coming in. Woo. There we go. So why'd you move to Seattle? What was that move for? Uh, my wife uh, was relocated with Amazon. So she works uh, at Amazon. Nice. And that was 20, 2019. So okay. we, were both, we both grew up, in, we met in school in the Midwest. And then she got a job, moved out here. Uh, we just had a baby. So we have a, a, a three-month-old now at home. Nice. Uh, which is amazing. And Congrats. we want to be closer to family and friends and all of that stuff. Yeah. And COVID kind of worked out in our favor in the sense that you can kind of re- relocate without a whole lot of, you know, pain, I guess. Yeah. In, yeah, yeah. in terms of jobs. So that's cool. Where'd you guys go to school? Indiana. Oh, man. By you, Indiana University. Yeah. 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 Go Badgers. That's all I got to say. There you go. Oh, you. Oh, man. Yeah. 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 It's been a good, yeah. Big Ten's been doing all right. Big Ten is doing all right. Badgers have I use number. I feel like with with basketball and and obviously football. Well, actually, football. Our program. I don't know if you've seen or not, but we're ranked like a number ten or eleven now. So we ended super strong. Oh, that's wild. Yeah, you guys had a good season. It's interesting. All right, we got people filing on in. We're gonna get started in a couple minutes. Uh, really excited to chat with Patrick today. Where's everyone from? Anyone here from Europe? Yeah, we'll see who's we who's in. hanging out. We can we can shout out some people. Always try to get all six continents. Asia. We got Asia. Okay. Danuka, good to see you. Chris Chicago, Chicago. That's my hometown. Moving back to Chicago in a couple of weeks. I love We're just it. a couple of Midwesterners here. Yeah. That's good. I went to school in Peoria. Dad's from Chicago. I'm always amazed when we have like Australia on the line. We're like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's yeah. so early. All right, okay. Nils, Frank got Frank for Germany. Love All right, it. so we got three continents. Love it. We got uh, South America. We got a couple minutes, too. Sweden. Sebastian Dang, from Stockholm, awesome. welcome. Christopher, ND at Wisconsin and Soldier Field. Nine no t- oh, Notre Dame. That'll there be awesome. Go. Notre Dame at Wisconsin. That'll be a good game. I went to nice. uh, South Bend for the first time for the winter classic a couple years ago for uh, hockey. And I got to see touchdown Jesus and everything. <laughs> That's nice. Damien <laughs> from Barcelona. Nice to see you. Yeah. We, uh, I, uh, I was in Boston for 10 years and the hockey out, out here is very serious, very serious. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Good to see you, Damien. Everyone's trickling in here. We're going to get started in just a couple minutes, but um, while we're waiting for you, just shout out who you are, where you're from. We're still looking for a couple other continents. See if we can get we can get everyone but Antarctica. Damien, uh, Damien, we did our our last company offsite right before COVID hit in Barcelona. It was it was awesome. And uh, Anna, our product designer, she set up this Airbnb experience. Uh, it's called Skate Therapy. Check it out. Uh, they teach you how to longboard, and we like longboarded all around Barcelona. Um, with this filmmaker and he shot us this like cool team video and i didn't know awesome. i had never been on a skateboard before and i was totally comfortable so really very I, cool spot yeah i love the idea of being able to longboard but i never i've never been on a skateboard i've never been on anything like that so what's up pete good to see you in boston here go i'm going to share my screen just to get this started presenter view and share Okay. Awesome. Today we're, we're really digging into to SaaS metrics. I'm super excited to, to chat with, with Patrick and, and hear his insights at ProfitWell. We're, we're talking really a lot about retention today. Uh, that re- net revenue retention is like a, a big thing for us, by the way, Patrick. That's like our new kind of it's holy new grail star. thing we're tracking. Yeah. Nice. Uh, recently, because we're like, we're, we're SMB SaaS, right? So our average contract sizes are pretty small. And we're like, hey, can we be one of the, the companies that has greater than, than yeah. 100%? Um, and, and so that's been things. So I'm excited to dig into this. Um, for those of, that, of you guys that don't know, uh, my name is Mike Cruz. I'm the co-founder of Visible. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. We got our emails on the next slide. Patrick's the CEO of ProfitWell. Uh, ProfitWell helps you 
uh, manage all of your recurring subscriptions and, and fight churn, uh, activation, get insights, you guys do revenue recognition, uh, pricing, pretty much anything related to subscription businesses. Well, money right. at least, revenue money. at least. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But yeah, yeah. We, we try to help you make more money in the subscription world. Yeah, and, and one of the things we'll, we'll talk about too, um, just to get into uh, some agenda and things we'll, we'll be chatting about, uh, we're going to get into to revenue and, and retention, and then we're going to talk a little bit about visible investor updates, sharing that with investors. Uh, we just launched an integration with ProfitWell as well, uh, which we're super excited about being actively used. It was like such, I was just telling uh, Patrick before we were we jumped on, is like talk about like great APIs and documentation. It was like seamless for, for our team to jump in and use it. And now we got people uh, actively using, which is which has been awesome. Uh, we, we are, if you want to use the hashtag visible webinars, uh, you can use Zoom chat. we got a team monitoring for questions. You can also email Matt and Patrick, uh, either during or after. We're happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, this is going to be recorded. Uh, and also, we're going to send a recap follow-up with email to all of the registrations. And so you guys have that uh, recording and, and the write-up after. Um, but let's just get into it. I'm going to stop sharing because these are, are Patrick's slides. So I'm going to stop. Patrick, I'm going to let you take over so you can flip through your slides. And, and I might jump in with some questions, but I want you to, to drive. Yeah, totally. Let's do it. So yeah, thanks for having me guys. And um, obviously uh, it's going to be going to be a good, hopefully action packed hour here. Um, if you end up having any other questions, obviously you can uh, email uh, Matt, you can use visible webinars on the social media channel of your choice, or just throw them in the chat or the Q and A. Uh, so no excuses for not asking questions here. But the big thing we want to do is, is, is give you a framework as well as a couple of benchmarks for basically reevaluating your overall retention strategy. You know, as Mike was saying, net dollar retention is, it's not that it's new, it's been around for a long time, but it's starting to become more and more in vogue because the whole idea or the beauty of the subscription model model is that you can clone your customers, as they say, because they stick around on this subscription. And so the game becomes how to keep as many of them around as possible and also get those existing customers to, to pay you more. And so we're not going to be able to go into everything around net dollar retention, especially because I want to kind of talk for 20 minutes or so here to leave plenty of time for questions. But what we will be able to do is give you some really, really good tactics. And I'll be able to kind of point out some other more strategic aspects that you should be kind of be focused on. So to give you a little bit of a redirect here, the big thing we're going to be doing is like, I want to give you things that can increase your overall lifetime value by somewhere between 10 and 60%. Obviously the 60% gains are the ones that take a lot more work, but there's plenty of little 10% gains here that definitely do add up. So we'll be walking through a bunch of those. Now, in terms of like, who the heck am I? Who am I here to talk about this? Well, it's not about me. It's really about the data here. And what I mean by that is um, ProfitWell, we build products that basically help with revenue automation. And what we mean by that is we want to help you basically plug into ProfitWell well, and then instantly or as instantly as possible, basically boost up your subscription revenue. And so the way that we do that and the products that we have is we have this product called ProfitWell Metrics. It's completely free. Um, it plugs into your subscription management system. So if you're using Stripe, Zora, Chargeify, Chargebee, Recurly, I'm sure I'm missing one or two here and offending someone, but basically anything you're using to basically manage your subscriptions, you plug it in and we give you free access to all of your subscription financial reporting. Um, so it's been kind of cool. Sick. Yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate love it. it. <laughs> what I was about to say is, yeah, you know, what's what's kind of cool about it too is like not only is it free, but then there's a bunch of free integrations as well into something like Visible. So if you're trying to send investor updates and things like that, you can just port right in your data um, and choose which data you kind of want to pass on to investors. And what's kind of cool, not only because it's free, but also we worked really, really hard on accuracy is we now have about 25% of the entire subscription market using ProfitWell. Um, and so that's everything from B2B SaaS all the way to subscription e-commerce, subscription media. Um, and that gives us this huge bevy of data to not only study, but we use that knowledge that we gain for our paid products, which help with things like retention as well as things like pricing. And so with that kind of hopefully a little bit of establishing credibility, but also kind of explaining where some of this data is going to be coming from, um, I'm excited to kind of jump in here. And the first thing I want to do is like make sure we're all starting from a good foundation. And, and the reason for that is because I think as kind of practitioners and operators in the world of subscriptions, um, we have a pretty big misconception when it comes to retention. And what I mean by that is there's, there's always that, that one guy or gal, um, they're typically in product. I will, I will admit, throw a little shade here to the product folks um, who basically say something like retention, it, you know, it, basically if the product's valuable enough, you have the right customer, retention isn't a problem. And it's not that this is 
is wrong. This is absolutely right. The problem is it's really incomplete. And what I mean by that is if you think about your retention, your cancellations, and let's imagine you know you have 100 customers who cancel and leave your business. Well, what we found in the data, and it depends on kind of your vertical, it depends on a couple of different factors, including kind of your price point. But overall, what we typically find is that of those 100 cancellations, about 60 of them are going to be from strategic cancellations. And this is what your product uh, leader is basically talking about. And it's made up of all of the different things that you know are the death by a thousand paper cuts that you're going to be working on for a decade to make sure you have the right product, make sure you have the right features, make sure you have the right target customer, fixing all those bugs, those types of things. But the reason this kind of statement from you know our, our, our great product, um, very humble leaders out there, is that is incomplete is mainly because there's this other part, um, which are tactical cancellations. And depending on the business, this can be up to about 40% of your cancellations. And these are things like your credit card failures, your payment failures, which are a really big deal, um, not optimizing things like term, not working to win back customers and things like that. And the reason I want to show you this is because I think a lot of us, we end up focusing so much on the death by a thousand paper cuts where you do need a really good product team and just a really good exec team in general to be able to execute. But if we can focus on these more tactical bits, we can actually improve our retention because ultimately what's going to end up happening is, is we're going to be able to fix those things quicker than the kind of years it's going to take to get to the right product, good product market fit and those types of things. And so this is kind of where when we started looking at the data and sort of thinking about what products we were going to build, we started to discover these problems, particularly credit card failures, which was the first one. And this is kind of where we spent most of our time studying, um, although we do study and understand a lot going on with the strategic side of the business. But this is kind of where we're going to spend a lot of time here now, because that's where I can give you the most tactical type of advice. Um, but with that being said, you know, how do we actually boost retention? So given this kind of framework or given this kind of way to think about things, um, the biggest thing to kind of think about is when you're thinking about retention, you first like, how do you measure success, right? And this is the biggest thing that I think a lot of people um, don't do inside their business is they don't evaluate things based on a KPI. And I know you've heard that advice, you know, to the point that me even saying it is kind of condescending, but the biggest thing is, is like actually finding that number. And so when you're thinking about retention, you kind of have two, two metrics, right? You have net revenue retention, uh, net dollar retention, negative churn. You'll hear about this in a couple of different ways. This is the basic idea of adding up how many people or how many dollars left you, how many of your existing customers increased their spend and by how much. And then basically the result of that, that calculation is your net dollar, your net revenue retention. Is the it other fair number to say, just to jump in real quick, yeah. sorry, uh, in a vacuum, like in a perfect vacuum, if you have greater than 100% net revenue retention, uh, your business can grow without even adding a new customer? Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's exactly the in, point. In I a think vacuum. Yeah. Yeah. In, in practice, as you're saying, because you're prefacing within a vacuum, it's a little bit yeah. more complicated, right? Because yeah. sometimes we get a little tricky in how we calculate things. And this is what's been, this has been interesting to follow, you know, kind of the, the whole concept of net dollar retention and even profit and these types of things mm -hmm. kind of come in and out of vogue with kind of the, the, the more VC backed community. And so mm -hmm. um, it's a little more complicated, but basically in a vacuum, the answer is yes. Yeah. And then the other number here, which is the number that a lot of us fixate on is basically churn, right? User churn, revenue churn. This is just a straight up measure of how many dollars or how many people are actually leaving the business. And the reason I lay this out this way is because you then have to think about what are the things that can influence these numbers? Well, there's three big categories. There's active cancellations, exactly how it sounds. People are actually leaving expansion revenue, your existing customers spending more with you, which is one of the most underutilized pieces of your overall retention. Um, and then finally, delinquencies, um, which we'll talk about a little bit. It doesn't sound like the sexiest topic in the world, but just to give you a little preview, delinquencies, if you're a credit card based business, meaning that's how you primarily get your revenue, um, it is the largest single bucket of lost customers. Um, it's that big. And so we'll talk about that in a second, but we're going to go through each of these pieces. Um, there's, I'm going to tell you about a bunch of different things in these pieces but I'm going to focus on a couple just to kind of keep this nice and tactical. But first up, the one that everyone kind of fixates on, how do I keep customers, right? How do I prevent them from leaving? And there's a lot of people who have talked about time to value and target segment. Um, we can definitely talk about that in the Q&A if you'd like, but I'm going to not fixate on it right now um, just because there is so much out there and we've written a lot on there too, so I can pass some stuff on. But the basic idea there is that, you know, kind of like a garbage in garbage out phenomenon. What I mean by that is if you have the wrong type of customer coming to you and it could be the wrong vertical, wrong size, whole host of things, 
those people aren't going to stick around. In addition to that, if you don't show the right customer where the value is and reinforce why your product is so important, they're also not going to stick around. Um, and so we'll kind of put a button in there in term, terms of like, if you want to talk about the Q&A, but the two big things we're going to talk about are term optimization and win back because these are super, super tactical. The first one I'd like to talk about, term optimization. Um, this is one of those things that we all intuitively understand this is important, or at least that this works, but a lot of us aren't really executing on it. And that's where kind of the problem comes into play. Uh, but to give you some numbers here, um, or the, the concept here is that basically longer term contracts equate to lower cancellations. We see this in the data left, right, and center. I can send you a couple studies we did on it. But the basic idea is, is that annual contracts typically have 30% better retention than monthlies. And the basic idea is someone's making one purchasing decision per year versus 12 even subconscious purchasing decisions per year. And for some of you who are in the consumer space where annual contracts aren't as popular, um, you'll be pretty happy to know that quarterlies still have better retention than overall monthly contracts. Um, and it's a simple math problem, but what's interesting is that the way that we go about doing this is very, very reactive. And what I mean by that is the one place that normally we ask people for an upgraded contract or an annual contract or a quarterly contract is typically when they sign up, when they haven't even experienced the product. Um, and then the other times sometimes is the end of year kind of dump your budget season, but even most of us aren't even doing that part. And so what I really recommend you do is to make sure that you're asking for kind of an extended contract beyond the initial sign up. And the way that this can look is basically going after those folks who have been with you at least a month, probably up to about 10 months. So right in that kind of second to 10 month range, mm -hmm. really, you should be looking at your own data to calculate this. But if you're not going to do that, just use that particular heuristic and then sending them an email or in-app notification that basically says, Hey, you've been a great and loyal member. We want to reward you for it. Here's, you know, two months free if you're a particular SaaS company, um, or here's ten dollars off if you're a subscription e-commerce company where you can't give away a month for free. But giving some sort of offer. And the really kind of important point here, and I don't have any slides on this, but I'll just kind of mention it is, um, make sure you're using physical numbers. So what I mean by that is one month, two months, $10 off, $100 off, um, or even for subscription e-commerce, some folks have used old inventory, like, hey, get this free t-shirt or get this free whatever. They don't call it old inventory, but they use something that's <laughs> physical or something that can you know, almost be grasped onto, mainly because the human brain, we think about those particular numbers very differently than percentages. We don't naturally understand percentages. And so um, in this study, there's been studies been done on this since the 1920s is when JC Penney did the first one. But basically what they found is like when you use like two for one, it performs at almost double, if not triple the rate in some cases than if you use the equivalent percentage or even two for 50% off, which would be the same type of offer. And so use some sort of offer. We've also seen people not even offer anything except for, hey, you can get on a longer term plan if you want um, and still see some success. And then make yeah. sure you close the loop here. Make sure that you don't have to go through the billing settings page, probably the worst page on your website. It's okay. It's everyone's worst page. Um, and just hit basically confirm or respond to an email to get hooked up. But this is something super tactical. You can implement this. I also recommend you can email folks or contact them probably about once every three months or so. So once a quarter, um, and you'll see basically your retention instantly go up mainly because you won't have as many cancellations. Um, the other piece here is like win back and triaging your cancellations. And what this really means is treating your offboarding with some um, level of urgency um, or focus rather than just kind of letting people leave. Um, and this gets a little controversial, not because I think that it's a bad idea, but because how much friction do you actually add to someone leaving? And mm -hmm. by no means do I suggest, you know, getting rid of your cancel button, making people call in. I think some people have to do that out of kind of, you know, we don't know what's going on. We have to just have these more high fidelity conversations. But what I do recommend is that when someone wants to leave, adding a little bit of friction. And I think the little bit of friction that you should add is probably a one to two question survey. And the reason for that survey is to learn something. So if you learn something about why they're leaving, you can then hopefully prevent those cancellations in the future. But the primary reason for these particular questions is to figure out, is there a way that you can save them? And what I mean by that is, let's say they say something along the lines of, I didn't have a chance to use the product yet. That happens, especially with touchless products. Someone gets really excited on a Thursday mm -hmm. night to try out your product. They forget about it. They kind of go away for the next few weeks. And all of a sudden, they're like, why am I paying for this? 
Well, in that particular situation, I want to offer like a salvage offer, which is basically a, you know, something where I can say, hey, well, how about we give you one month for free? Or how about we give you $100 off next particular month, whatever offer that you can sustain and doing this in a way that basically kind of acts as a little bit of like a tease right before they're leaving in order to kind of keep them. Um, and then the idea here is that if they stay around for one additional month, then hopefully they'll stick around for more months because they'll have more time to actually see the value in your product. Now, keep in mind, if your product's terrible and you haven't figured out your value, your customer, all these other things, the really early product market fit things, this isn't going to help you. It might help you a little bit, but it's not going to help you in the long run. But if you've kind of figured a lot of those things out, your whole goal is to make sure you're getting those people who are kind of on the fence to basically being over the fence in the sense of giving them some extra time. Now, some other pieces of this um, maintenance plans, like if someone says, Hey, um, I'm going to be back. You know, if you have an episodic type product, Hey, we'll keep all of your data. We'll keep everything, all of your settings, um, for a dollar a month or $10 a month, depending on the product. We've even seen this used in consumer products, especially where there's data involved in those consumer products mm -hmm. or preferences works really well. And then with COVID, you know, not to talk about COVID, I was thinking we'd get through this whole thing, but you saw a lot of pause plans. Um, some other options, Freemium, I think if you're using some sort of freemium offer, even a membership, if you're a consumer product, um, that works well. And then I always want to point out, you can, you can play chicken, uh, meaning like, hey, like, we'll, we'll be here when you get back, especially if they say something like, oh, you don't have a feature or a style I'm looking for, um, or, you know, some other derivation. I think the big thing here, though, is just making sure you have some sort of triage because not everyone who wants to cancel is someone that, you know, is a bad customer. These are a lot of folks mm -hmm. who just need more time or they'll be back. And you want to make sure you have some hooks to keep that relationship. But one of the, one of the quick things, just yeah. a, a quick hack, I think related to this is um, we implemented Stripe's new customer billing portal recently nice. um, just because it's like, Hey, no one's going to be better than Stripe at building. I hope know, so. This page. Uh, we hope so at least, but we were like, Hey, let's do something crazy or we thought it was crazy because like you could just cancel right there, right? Like it, it cancel yeah. and we can't triage. Um, but what we did is we built a workflow. If someone hits that, um, it drafts an email uh, in mm -hmm. my email inbox, kind of personalized. Hey, Mike, personally reaching out, you know, why did you cancel? And I send those each night and just batch send them um, if someone's canceled that day. And it's certainly greater. Like we, we certainly have saved revenue uh, quite a bit from just simply awesome. reaching out and saying why, because you might hear it's, uh, a foreign currency issue. Like, oh, the exchange rate went way out of whack because I live in yeah. Brazil and, oh, cool, let's fix that. Or, you know, hey, I need this feature. Oh, maybe we do a better job of surfacing that, but we actually do have that. So that, that's another nice little hack we've done is just like do that through um, Zapier and just trigger that too. That's wild. Yeah, and I think the, yeah. the biggest thing there you're pointing out, like there's a lot of reasons that have nothing to do with the value of your product. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can fix that. Let's fix that. Oh, let's keep you around, right? And I think the other thing here is... Um, it's not just the learning, but you know, kind of a good transition, at least to this this slide, is like you can win back these customers. And and I think that a lot of people we we like to say timing has a lot to do with sales, but we don't like to like think about like timing also has a lot to do with why someone leaves, right? And so you have this this customer base that is no longer customers who understands your product. Hopefully, some of them liked your product, but there's a whole host of reasons that you're never truly going to understand of why they left but they understand and they know that your product exists. So it's really easy to go back to them six months after they came or lost or canceled their product or nine months or 12 months and basically say, hey, we got this new feature. Um, thought you, you know, use this and happy to have you come back at you know, first month free or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those places, it's not gonna be the largest marketing campaign you're going to run unless you're at a, a certain size. But it is one of those things that's really, really powerful because awareness already exists. And especially if you come out with a feature or some other functionality that helps the thing that they didn't have before, um, it's one of those really good ways to kind of win those customers back. Yeah. Um, so active cancellations, there's a lot more we can talk about in the Q&A, but those are two really, really tactical bits. Now, in terms of expansion revenue, the, the basic idea here is that a lot of us are not using the advocates that we have. We've all heard that phrase, you know, hey, you, it's easier to keep a customer around than get a brand new customer, right? Well, it's also easier to get more money from your existing customer base who are presumably happy or at least happy enough to stick around than it is to get those brand new customers. And the couple of different things we'll talk about here, and we'll kind of be brief in most of them because these take a little bit more of a deep dive to really properly kind of explain how to do them. But the basic idea is like, 
getting your customers to be able to buy more from you. And the most blunt ways to do that are through cross sales or upsells. Cross sales are basically, you know, an additional product. So a whole different product that you can basically offer. Um, this has become really, really popular. And it's also the companies who are doing this. I don't have the data in here, but I can send it to you. Companies that are multi-products are typically growing at about 30 to 40% higher um, than those companies that have just single products, um, mainly because there's just more surface area to basically sell into a customer base. Um, upsells are basically premium versions of your existing product. So in the consumer space, having you know literally a luxury line or a premium line um, in the B2B space, this is having one that has all the gnarly enterprise features. Um, and then we'll talk about the other two in just a second here, but I think I already made some of these points. But to give you a little bit of a, some numbers here, the best companies in the world right now have more than 20% of their new revenue from existing customers. So if they get $100 in a given month, brand new money, 80 of that's coming from new customers. Um, and then 20 at least is coming from their existing customers, those existing customers yeah. spending more. Um, to give you a little bit of metrics, and I have a whole study I can send you that goes into this data a little bit more in depth, but most companies you're looking at about less than 10%. And I would argue that if most of you on this webinar today go and look at your profitable dashboard, hopefully, if not, you know, wherever you're storing your data, um, you're probably at close to zero, if not under that 10%. Um, and so we can use cross sales, we can use upsells. The really good starter or gateway kind of drug to good expansion revenue um, are add-ons. Now, add-ons are basically kind of cross-sells, but they're not quite full-featured products. So to give you some examples, um, you can sell priority support, right? 20% of your customer base, I've done enough pricing studies to know that 20% of your customer base is willing to pay for priority support just because they've had bad experiences or they're people like me that just don't like lines, right? Um, now, they might not be willing to pay as much as you know it takes to actually give them priority support, but it is one of those things where it's a relatively easy add-on. Um, other add-ons, so for example, we have kind of this um, you know premium package for a free profitable product where you can get real-time ingestion. Um, you know, for, for a fee rather than, you know, your data getting updated every hour, that type of a thing. And so there's a lot of different things you can do. And normally these are features that aren't necessarily good for the entire customer base, but the people who actually care about them are willing to pay more for them. That's kind of the way to look at it. And to give you a couple of numbers here, um, from a data perspective, it's the most underutilized aspect of any subscription company, I would argue. Um, Add-ons are one of those things that like, because of the cost or relatively low cost of implementing them and the benefit, um, they're just so, so powerful. And we did this little study where we basically looked at customers who had no add-ons and then customers who had at least one or more add-on. Um, and basically what we found is that those folks who had one or more add-on basically had about 20 to 50% higher lifetime value. Now, the initial kind of reaction to this is obviously the stance to reason because they're paying you more. But what this isn't showing you in this data, and I'm happy to share the study in, in more depth here, um, is they retain at a higher rate, meaning they stick around for more months, mainly because they're getting more and more kind of embedded within your product. Um, and you're offering them something that they're actually looking for um, that they're getting that buy into. So add ons are really, really powerful. Um, the one other thing here are value metrics. I've talked a lot about value metrics. And so there's a lot of stuff I can send you if you're interested. But the basic idea here is um, value metrics are how you charge. So it's per hundred visits, per user, uh, per thousand points, whatever you're kind of charging. It's really important to charge in some type of value metric fashion rather than just based on features or rather than just based on, you know, kind of all in one kind of pricing. This would be the equivalent of, hey, if you come in, you get everything for this price. And if you want a couple extra features, you have to pay a little bit more. That type of pricing is basically going out the window. Um, when we started ProfitWell, probably about 15% of subscription companies were using value metrics. Now it's about 55%. And the reason so many people use this is because you bake expansion revenue and lower churn into your pricing. And what I mean by that is mm. if I come in and I have one user, but then I have another user, all of a sudden, like I'm not sitting there thinking, oh, I'm paying for too much of this product. It's a really good conversation that you can have with your customer because it's like, hey, congrats, you're growing. I saw that John entered you know, the product. We're just going to charge you for that additional user and you keep on going, right? 
Similarly, you might see some downgrades if John all of a sudden cancels his seat, but I'm not going to cancel because I'm still individually using the product. And so we typically see expansion revenue is double for value metric based pricing versus feature based pricing. And in addition to that, churn is about half. So you're kind of getting a nice double whammy there. And I can send yeah. you that data if you're interested. The last kind of big piece, I know sexiest topic in the world, we're going to talk about credit card and payment failures. Um, and the reason I do, like I do joke about this, but like the reason I do think this is such a powerful kind of like sexy aspect of retention is because, again, if you're getting, you know, payments through credit or debit cards as your primary way of, of you know, making revenue, it's purely tactical. This is a mechanical problem that can be solved. It's not like you have to be like, hey, I need to you know, fix this feature. I'm not sure if it's this feature or that. It's just fixing some of your infrastructure. Now, it doesn't mean it's absolutely easy, but there's some really low hanging fruit here. And then there's some higher hanging fruit that I can kind of point out here. Um, I mentioned this before. It's the largest single bucket of lost customers. If you have 100 people cancel, typically it's about 20 to 40 percent, or 20 to 40 of those 100. Um, it depends on your pr normally lower price points have more of these. Your customer base, depending on who you're going after, um, and the type of product you have, it might be smaller, it might be larger. Um, and the reason for this is mainly because there's 130 reasons why a credit card fails. We're going to go through every single. I'm just kidding. We're not going to go through every single <laughs> one. But there's expiration failures, limit failures. Um, you know, international gateways not recognized. There's so many different reasons. And unfortunately, not one of those reasons is the biggest one. So I think normally, and this is a little different depending on the company, the largest, you know, kind of payment failure will be like 15% of your failures. So it's not like you have like one thing to actually solve. Um, and normally that's expirations, by the way, that is normally at the larger bucket. Um, but to give you a little bit of context, we're pretty bad at recovering these folks. Um, and I have deeper studies if you want to go more into this data, but Right now, if 100 people have their payment fail, we only really recover about 30 of them. So 70 of them end up leaving, um, which is insane if you really think about it. Um, and normally, like depending on your business, we typically see you should be around 60 to 80. Now, the reason it's not 100 is that people use this as the excuse to leave. Like one out of five folks, sometimes two out of five, they're, this is the reason they're going to leave or this is the excuse for them leaving. But the TLDR is, is that most of you should be able to recover probably double what you're recovering right now, which depending on the size of your business could be, could be a good chunk of change. Now, mm -hmm. how do you actually recover? Well, it's a game of inches or centimeters for everyone who's outside the US right now. Um, but basically, there's, there's not one thing. There's a lot of little things, and, and some of them have a little bit higher impact. Um, it does start before the point of failure. So what I mean by that is, um, expirations, really big bucket, but the way that we handle expirations is really, really important. Um, what I mean by that is um, do not send emails before the point of failure. Meaning if I know that my customer's card's about to expire, don't send emails. Now there's a little asterisk here. If you are like gonna study the data and be super intense about it and figure out, and it's such a big problem, you're gonna figure out exactly when to send an email and when not to send an email, then you can send emails. If you're not going to do any of that, just turn them off. Um, and if you're a subscription e-commerce company where you have to send a pre kind of, hey, we're about to charge you email, then don't send that email. Send the, hey, your card's going to expire, so we can't send you this really cool product. Um, but for everyone else, especially in B2B SaaS, just don't send these emails. Now, what you should do- um, Why? Oh yeah, sorry. I that's that's on the next slide here. Oh, um, it sorry. increases. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. I almost wasn't going to say it, and then the slide was going to remind me. But the reason is, is that it increases active cancellations by 10 to 20%. So what I mean by this is right now, um, expirations, people, like some of those expirations will not actually be expired, uh, meaning um, like all of a sudden there'll be an auto update from Amex, especially, um, or, you know, there'll be a couple of other reasons um, that people will kind of have naturally their cards be updated. Other reasons are like people are just naturally going to be good citizens and update their credit cards. But what ends up happening is most of us, we go, oh, we're marketers. Let's get this extra card updated. And we end up sending someone five emails over the course of 30 to 45 days. And then all of a sudden the person is just constantly reminded of the purchase, sometimes gets annoyed and is like, screw it. 
or like subconsciously goes, eh, I don't need this anymore. Right. And so it's right. one of those things where you have to be really careful because obviously you want to send receipts, obviously you want to send notifications and things like that, but you want to be careful not to go overboard and all of a sudden force that kind of thinking about the decision so many different times that someone's like, ah, oh, let's try something else or, or, or something else. So what we recommend is using in-app notifications. Um, one SMS text message works really, really well as well. Um, but it's one of those things where, again, just being super blunt, if you're not going to spend the time, just use in-app or SMS, um, don't use emails unless you're mm -hmm. going to spend the time. Now, after the point of failure, this is where we're going to get most of the recovery. Um, the first thing is just making sure your retries are turned on. So because there's so many reasons why a card can fail, some of those reasons are fixed just by retrying the credit card at another day, right? Now, most of your billing systems should have this built in. Um, just make sure they're turned on I know that sounds kind of preposterous, but sometimes, you know, an engineer or billing person will want to be experimenting with something. They'll check a different box and then all of a sudden they'll like accidentally turn them off and not turn them back on. I recommend if you're not going to do any data research or anything like that, just trust the smart retries that are built into the product. So this could be, um, so Stripe has smart retries. I think a lot of the billing management like Chargebee and Chargeify have their own versions of smart retries. Mm -hmm. They're, they're going to be better than anything. Um, if you really want to go intense or you have a larger company that has a bigger problem, you probably want to spin up your own retries. And the reason I say that is because just really briefly, um, your billing or your processing company, they're looking at this data and they have a really good incentive, obviously, to get you to you know have your cards go through, but they're looking at the data on a very global basis. And so they're not necessarily building a model that's custom to you. They're building it over you know what different types of companies that look like you. And that works pretty well. But what we found, especially with larger companies, is that when they spin up their own retries, in addition to the smart retries that a company's already doing, they see the best results. And to give you an example, so in consumer space, basically, you know, retrying a credit card, 12.01 a.m. Um, Pacific on the 1st or the 15th of the month, aka payday for most people, um, actually works really, really well. It's, it's an extra like 3% in performance, which you might be like, eh, is that, is that that much? But on an absolute basis, you know, that's, that's an extra mm -hmm. couple inches, if you will, um, to actually solving, uh, solving this, especially if you're big enough that, you know, 3% means a lot. Now, a couple other things, email and in-app, um, as well as SMS, this is where the bulk of people are going to come back. A um, couple of other things, stylized emails. I know you're like, our brand's amazing. Our designers are great. Let's use really stylized emails. They're not as effective. Uh, plain text is about 50% more effective in terms of completions, not just opens and click-throughs and things like that. And the basic idea is because when I see a marketing email, especially a marketing email that's asking me to do something, my instinct's just to archive, right? But if I see an email from Kate here that it's kind of like, it, I'm pretty sure Kate did this in an automated fashion, but it's still Kate. There's a little bit of a reciprocity or like an ob obligation that's built up here for a good portion of your users. Um, at least that's what we've kind of found in testing. And then all of a sudden, like, I'm like, I don't want to let Kate down, right? So there's a lot of people who respond to these and go, oh, I'm actually canceling or, oh yeah, I got, I'm going to update my card on Friday when I get the new card or like things like that. Um, whereas your marketing emails, you won't see those responses. And also notice a couple of other little things that we found. Um, not very bill collectory at all, right? This is the emails I typically see, even if they're plain text, are super bill collectory. Um, this is very like, oh, something happened. I don't know, right? It must be must be a fluke, right? As the emails go on, you can get a little bit like more um, aggressive is the wrong word, but a little more aggressive. Um, so our next email we typically send, and we do a lot of testing on these um, for our customers, but we'll see like second notice, right? All of a sudden we'll use a little bit more like, ooh, or, or like urgent kind of language in these types of things. But remember, these are your customers. So reinforce value, want to get them back. Don't treat them like, you know, they're, they're not customers, if you will. Um, and then Testing messaging is important. Like when we kick off a new customer, we have like 16 tests we do. And then there's just ongoing tests because again, subject lines, copy, time mm -hmm. of day, day of week. Um, we also localize all messaging automatically. Um, we see that increases recovery rate by about five to 10%, especially if you have like 20% or more of your base in a different language. Um, so it's just one of those things where again, a lot of little stuff you can do. Um, I'd recommend obviously just making sure you have email set up first before you get really aggressive, but just trying to show you a couple of other things to do. And then the one thing, if you have some engineering resources, the one big thing that I would do um, 
is making sure your users don't have to sign in to update their credit cards. Um, and you can do this, it's a little bit of clever thinking, a little bit of technology you needed, but it is like fully PCI compliant, it's all secure, all that kind of fun stuff. But when they click through, make sure they go to more of a marketing page that has just like an interstitial on it, um, just so they see it's your site, it's your domain. Some people will like think this is phishing and they'll click off, it's very few people, but then they'll go update their card um, just by logging in. Um, just for safety. But the, the important thing is the marketing site. Uh, Shopify and a couple of other companies have like this kind of naturally built in, but it goes to, frankly, a really scammy looking landing page. Um, basically, it's just a white page with a logo and then the rest or the white header with the logo and then the rest of the page is blue with like not even a very web 3.0 looking, you know, kind of form. So it, it just doesn't look good. And we've seen that those types of forums, there's just major drop off uh, because people just don't trust it. And so send people to your site, use an interstitial. It's like the smart way to do it. And then the last thing, and again, this is like a, you know, again, a little condescending to say, but I think it's really important mainly because um, one out of 20 of you, so a few of you on this, this, this webinar are going to have this problem. Make sure you're locking out the customers not paying you. And I know, again, that sounds so like, you know, offensive just to suggest that you're not locking out those customers, but we just find there's a portion of you, again, a billing person or an engineer went in, they're testing a bunch of different things, they turn something off. And then what ends up happening is people who actively cancel, they end up basically, um, you know, getting kicked out of the product, but the people who aren't paying you, um, they're in a perpetual state of purgatory. So they're basically getting access to the product, but they're not paying you. Um, we did have a company, a rather large company that came to a webinar like this and then basically um, got recovered somewhere around $8 million within the next month because that they were running into this problem. So it was the, the greatest growth hack and the reason to come to webinars. Um, they eventually became a customer, thankfully. Um, yeah, because, but so. we, didn't, we didn't get credit for the $8 million, unfortunately. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, basic idea, you're not going to do all of these unless you're larger or this is a bigger problem for you, but doing some of these basics takes you an afternoon, max a week to do, um, and it can get some really, really big gains. But um, just to recap here, um, you know, it's a game of incremental optimization. We talked a lot about some tactics here. There's a lot of other things you need to do on the strategy side, but I would just encourage you to do at least one of these things in the next week or so, um, mainly because, again, it's one of those things that it just it compounds over time as you get more customers in um, and just make sure you keep more of them around and you keep earning more from them. Um, but we'll send out the deck. I can send you an extended version of the deck as well. But the big thing is, is obviously this takes some work. It's not magic. Um, it's just making sure that you do some of the tactical pieces and all that kind of fun stuff. And if you have any questions on this or anything, this is just my direct email address. Um, and I can send some of those supplemental materials, but also can uh, ask, answer some questions in Q&A. But I'll give it over to Mike again. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about Visible here. But um, yeah, excited, excited to keep moving. That was awesome. I wrote down a couple of notes even for us. Um, nice, man. It's funny. We, 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 I mean, early on before, you know, as we are figuring out product market fit, uh, I don't think we locked you out of the app if your credit card failed. Like I would personally go and, and email you, mm. but it's funny, like how much that works. Like we just put a red bar across the top and then eventually, yeah, we'll lock you out and helps a lot. It works. <laughs> yeah, it helps a lot. Uh, so we were, I was one of those 20 people for sure. Like um, well, that was, that was awesome, Patrick. I got some questions coming in, so I'll, we'll hit up Q and A shortly here, but real quick, just on, on visible and, and, um, profitable. We're super excited for our integration we built with them. Um, you're able to share any of your key SaaS metrics, recurring revenue metrics that you have within ProfitWell, and, and we combine those with other sources. So HubSpot, uh, Salesforce, Stripe, Google Sheets, Google Analytics, anything you might be using to run your business. Um, we, we help visualize that and, and share that with your investors, potential investors team. Uh, and so we just launched our, our ProfitWell integration. Uh, I think 39 metrics I counted of, of different um, metrics you can pull out from uh, your ProfitWell account. Again, it's free. So you go sign up, use, start using the free version of ProfitWell, start using the free version of Visible and uh, get, get start getting some of these insights and, and put into Visible. Um, so be certain to check that out. We'll link to the, the integration page and, and the video and all of that so you can check it out. Um, but quickly on, on Visible, you know, we build tools for founders to, uh, we call it update, raise and track. So how do I update my investors and potential investors? How do I manage a fundraise? and track K core KPIs that are going to be relevant for those investors. Uh, one of the things that we like to, to think through is uh, follow one funding. Like one of our thesis is if I'm uh, using and, and updating my investors effectively, uh, I should be able to get a bridge or follow one funding um, and, and the data speaks for itself. Um, 
I think 300% of uh, users or, or this is drawn on data. If you're seeing a regular investor update, uh, you are 300% more likely to get follow-on funding. There's a ton of research that's gone into this and I can tell you why. Um, separate from this, because I want to make sure we get to the Q&A. But just, just know that if you do it, you're going to be way more successful in getting future rounds. Um, we have 3,200 customers worldwide, uh, over six continents. I don't think we have a customer in Antarctica, unfortunately. One day. Uh, and $2 billion in, in one day. I might just go there and, and spin up a, a credit card just so I can do it. Like um, it. Uh, we've raised over $2 billion for, or our, our founders have raised over $2 billion in the last 12 months. Um, so just kind of quick investor updates 101, and then we'll jump into Q&A. Um, again, this is very much uh, best practice. I think guide rails. Everything, every business is obviously unique, but I think these are just some some guide rails for you to think about for your company. Uh, I'd say consistent cadence. So if you do it on the seventh of the month or the second Tuesday or the fifteenth, whatever that is, just keep it consistent because uh, your stakeholders are going to know to get the message on that day, and they're never going to bug you again uh, if you consistent uh, uh, consistently send it out. Uh, and I think. Like if you're in that kind of acceleration formation stage, you're just getting started or you're actively fundraising, I think a weekly email takes you 15 minutes to write, if, if not less, uh, will be highly beneficial. It's going to build momentum, create FOMO for, for fundraising efforts and, and really show how you're progressing. Then as you raise kind of your first round, call it pre-seed to series A, I think like a monthly update is amazing. And then once you get to like a growth stage, call it B and later, you probably have a board a package you put together and I think quarterly is, is totally acceptable as you kind of escape the, the scaling part of the, of the business. And in, in terms of like things that you'd want to put into your update um, and, and just making sure it's comparable, it's like, don't cherry pick whatever the best metric is each month. If one metric, if, if one month it's net revenue retention and the next month it's active users, like don't pick what the best metric is, always keep it consistent. Like investors are gonna call bullshit on that. Your team will call bullshit on that. No. Um, but also include growth in absolute numbers, like growing 100%. Like, hey, we grew active users 100% this month doesn't mean much when you're going from one to two um, versus like if I'm going from, you know, 10,000 to 20,000. But I, I would always include absolute and uh, the, the percentage change uh, for any of the different KPIs that you're, that you're tracking. Um, and I'd always share, this is again, through the frame of I've now raised capital for my business, but like no matter what, if you're healthcare, biotech, SaaS, whatever it is, like cash burn and runway, are like the vitals of you, like, are you a breathing, living thing? Uh, and it doesn't matter what you do. Uh, and so, you know, cash is obviously how much cash you have in the bank, uh, burn, you know, I, I always do cash burn. So how much cash left the bank this quarter or this month? Uh, and then runway, I will typically take the average of the last three months of burn. Uh, I'll take the cash and I'm going to get the runway. Like, here's how much cash, here's how many months we have until we're dead with zero dollars cash in the bank. Um, I would also only share these with your investors, right? I would not share this with potential investors that can be used against you in a fundraising scenario, but again, for the lens of using it for your current investors. And then uh, probably the biggest benefit you'll get from sending out an investor update are what we call ask, right? These are ways people can help you uh, and, and, and right? Because an investor is only successful if their portfolio is successful. So that by nature, they should be incentivized to help you. Um, so always include an ask section. Um, I think a good hack here is always included thanks as well. Like here are the people who helped me for my last update. Cause then other investors are going to see that they're going to want to jump in and help because it's like, Oh shit, Patrick ego. Uh, introduced the yeah, ego leaderboard. It, it's huge. So always include ask, but always include thanks. Um, and also make it super specific, right? Like we love interested companies with more than a thousand employees. That could be any, really any company. Uh, but if you say VPs of marketing at companies with greater than a thousand employees in CPG in North America, your investor or person reading that can quickly kind of mentally think through like, who do I know and can enter you to? So the more specific you are, the better. Um, and like, oh, we're hiring for an engineer. Everyone's hiring for an engineer. Like, how can you make that as specific and also as frictionless as possible? Like put a, a tweet together that someone can click and send it out or do the Boolean search for them on um, LinkedIn and paste that into when they click the link and searches their LinkedIn. Like there's different ways you can hack it. Just make it frictionless lasers. Investors are lazy. Um, also use it to fundraise. So Dom is one of our customers from Fast, pretty active on Twitter. Uh, again, we'll send this out so you can kind of see this playbook, but he basically says, I didn't know anyone when I moved to America from Australia. I put an investor update uh, email together immediately. I put my progress, but more importantly, here are the things I want to accomplish in the next month. 
And then when you send the next email out, say, here's all the things we accomplished. Oh, by the way, we said we're going to do that. Because now they have three or four months of use doing what you said you were going to do. Hmm. And then they're like, hey, now I'm happy to go give you X amount of dollars because I've seen that you can execute uh, and you do what you say you're going to do. Um, you, you put cold people on there. Like it works because uh, you're giving them an insight and building a relationship with them. Um, we say, you know, connect the lines or, or investors don't invest in dots, but, but lines and trends. And uh, I think it's a, it's a really easy, interesting um, way to kind of hack a fundraise. Cover that quickly. Um, these are some of my favorite intangibles investor updates as well. Uh, it's time to reflect and change. Like so much happens in 30 days. You look up and you're like, oh my freaking God, like we did so much. Uh, and you feel really kind of proud of that accomplishment. Uh, mm -hmm. But also like, what do we want to stop doing or, or new things we want to start doing? Uh, so I really love that time for, for my monthly update. Um, it'll stop inbound requests. So if you have investors, no one's going to bug you if you're proactively sending something out. Uh, and then really, I think this is the biggest thing is that it's a sign of active, engaged founder or entrepreneur, like you're a great fiduciary of the business. Um, I don't think this slide made it into this version, but there's a ton of data online, like Elizabeth Dean from Hustle Fund, like 80% of companies don't send a regular update. Uh, mm -hmm. To me, that screams huge arbitrage opportunity, right? Like yeah. there, there's 80% of a portfolio that you simply sending an update or doing something that um, a lot of companies aren't doing. So you're going to be more way likely to get uh, any of those asks, you know, whether it's intros for future rounds, hires, customers, like you're going to be top of mind all of the time. Yeah. Um, so kind of just quick recap here. Just do it. Um, send and get feedback. Like I think people want, to, they imagine like a perfect update. Uh, I, I think it's just like send something out and your investors will be like, oh my God, this is awesome. And then you'll get some feedback being like, oh, would you mind including this thing? Or what does this mean? And then you can, you know, iterate just like product and send something out the next month. Uh, always keep it consistent, comparable, use ask, leverage it for fundraising, get more money. That was the, the shortened version. We'll make sure to link to the longer version I gave of this, um, of some of the interesting data that we found through this as well. Um, but we'd love just to, to jump into some Q&A here, but we have a couple minutes left. Yeah, and while you're pulling those up, I also, yes. I also found, so we're, we, we've are we been customer funded or booster. I don't know what the, the yeah, word du jour sure. is. Uh, we haven't raised money. Um, and so what's interesting is we still do a similar, basically the exact same thing as what you just described to advisors or people that are yeah. kind of notables, I guess we kind of call them for our business. And what we found is it works really, really well because people want to be helpful and they either want to be helpful because they naturally want to be helpful or they care about their reputation as like an advisor, an investor, et cetera. And so- yeah. Either way, like it's a really easy way to get help, and so few companies are doing it. Um, I've also seen people do this, like the same concept with um, just like their mentors, right? Like yeah. just like updates, like treating themselves almost as the company. And um, I just think it's a really, really good idea in general. Yeah, yeah, um, love that. And I will say with team too, I think sharing that with a team on a monthly or there's a sense of ownership. Like I have no data on this, but anecdotally I'll say uh, your employee turnover, my guess is a big reason a lot of, uh, or I know for a fact, right? A lot of reasons people leave a company is because there's no transparency. They don't know what's going on or how, what yeah. they can do can impact things. And if you're being transparent with what's going on in the organization, whether it's good or bad, by the way, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be good. Um, that they're, if you're more transparent, you're way more likely to retain uh, your employees. And I even use my investor updates for um, hiring as well. That's mm. as a candidate's coming in, I'll send them the last three updates. Like, hey, here are the last three things that the last three updates I've sent to our investors. That's and cool. You're more than welcome to feel, read them and, and, and see what's going on in the business. So you have some context uh, and you'll see that it's not all just great things that we're trying to sell you on, but like the problems and how we're uh, approaching them too. Cool. Uh, awesome. Okay. So we got some questions. Um, Nils uh, wrote a highly tactical one about net revenue retention. I oh think boy. we'll um, answer that one through email. Um, so I wrote this one down. We have, we'll get Nils email because uh, it's about defining um, what basically if we're reporting and our, okay, I'll just read it. Screw it. Uh, right. <laughs> I'm already there halfway through it, so we're good. Yeah, okay. There are many different definitions of net revenue retention. Um, if you report yearly NRR to investors, but you have monthly contracts and NRR looks exceptionally good just because existing customers who joined in December of the prior year only generated one month of revenue, but 12 months of revenue in the current year. 
Um, I mean, maybe we can get back to something tactical here, but like, is there a right answer for NRR? Or is it just yeah. how you back up your definition of it? Yeah, basically, like Niels is saying, like you can unintentionally or intentionally be a little nefarious with how you report net dollar retention. Um, sure. You know, is this an issue, especially when reporting to investors? Which definition of NRR would you use? Okay, so my big thing of metrics is in general, and in, in <laughs> metrics are only useful if they're useful. Right. Yeah. And so to me, like, so for example, like lifetime value, like thinking about lifetime value in like the first six weeks of a company, unless it's just from like a trying to think through, like, is this a viable business is just dumb. Like you shouldn't do it. Like, because it's going to mm -hmm. jump around, like your, your first customer is going to jump around that one canceled. Like you just don't have enough history to understand what lifetime is. And so I, I think for me, like, and I, you were suggesting this is like, you have to, you have to, you have to put what's useful. And in addition to that, you probably should cut the metric or segment the metric, maybe not on the main slide, but in like the, the appendix slide. So you cut it down in a bunch of different ways. And the reason you do that is because you want to look at like, what is the most intellectually honest, like track of what's going on. And then all of a sudden in the appendix, if we want to go deep into that, we can, I think a lot of companies, yeah. they, you know, again, have not raised cash, um, you know, or been significantly involved in raising cash before, but it's one of those things where they, they kind of want to play the investment game, which don't get me wrong. Like you have to play, but <laughs> It, it, it's going to blow up in your face at some point. Um, it mm -hmm. might buy you a month, but it's not going to buy you a year when everything's actually terrible. And it might actually give you a full sense of security. So I would just be as, as intellectually honest as possible um, in order to, to kind of provide things. And sometimes it's unintentional though. I think some people, they do calculations and they don't realize that it's, it's problematic. Yeah. Uh, this is a good question from uh, Rustin. Uh, how any data. So I have a SaaS company. Uh, in this example, and I send out like a usage report, like, oh, sure. uh, we did this many things for you this this week, month, day, whatever that might be. Um, any data on on how that could help with with retention? Yeah, so That's I like don't have data handy to like be like, oh, 20% or something like that. Sure. I do know that I can find it though. I can dig it up because we do have enough people to cross section this. Well, we have found um, a couple of anecdotes and as well as the last time we cut this data, which was a few years ago, is that when you send a notification that reinforces whatever the North Star metric is for your user, it helps. So for mm. us, retain, it's how much money did we recover for you in the last week? I think we send ours weekly. It's fixated on that number. It's not fixated on how often you log in. It's not fixated on like engagement of any kind. It's fixated on the metric that is important to them. So for you, it might end up being like how many contacts it did they get the last week? How much money did they save by not having to pay for ads? Like that's something that HubSpot did in the early days. But yeah, it does help. You just have to do it for the right metric. And sometimes it's hard to know what the right metric is for you. Like for an analytics product, it's kind of hard for us to figure that out because it's not based on how often they logged in or what they opened, unfortunately. So there isn't like a really clean metric for it. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Uh, I love that reinforcing the North Star. What about, okay, so we talk about annual pricing as one of the tactical things um, for reducing churn. Um, I wrote down like, should I should we get rid of annual pricing out of the gate completely? Like, should you be able to, uh, or, or I guess maybe best approaches, right? Like, yeah. should we only have monthly plans and then let someone convert to annual after the fact, right? Or like, what are, you what are your thoughts on just pricing for annual? Uh, what kind of discount should I give someone? Is it months or percentage? Yeah. Like, uh, what are kind of some guide rails there? So I think, I think you should always, well, always is, gets us in trouble, but I think you should, if you're offering up an annual option upfront, you should still offer that option because for some, some products, like you're going to see 10% of people sign up for annual versus monthly. Hey, that's, that's, that's baked in retention from the gate. Right. Um, and then some of the products they get into what, you know, we kind of coined as the Amex effect, which is the basic idea is there your, your annual package might be a hundred, one fifty, or $200. And that's enough for me just to swipe my credit card. Right. I'm excited. I'm going to use the product. I'm really invested. Oh, it's only 200 bucks for the year. Great. I'm going to swipe my credit card. Right. Um, and so that's the, one of the things that you can kind of use that as your advantage. Normally that gets into like consumer products, but I, I just think it's one of those things that keep it there unless it's, there's some reason it's distracting or no one's signing up for it and then kind of consider. And in terms of the, the discounts, um, like I kind of said, don't use percentages. We've seen this in SaaS subscriptions all over the place that like percentages don't work as well as whole numbers. Um, it's just one of those things, like, again, like I said before, humans just don't recognize it, yeah. but in terms of this, the amount of discount, 
I, I would actually start with, unless you're trying to get into the Amex effect. So sometimes you might be selling something for 20 bucks a month, but you want your annual to be a hundred bucks, right? So you're given a significant discount for that annual theoretically, but unless you're in that situation, I actually would just do like, start with a month, like, Hey, yeah. one month off too many people jump to two months or three months without much thought. And they go, Oh, it's working. And it's like, yeah, but it might actually work with just one month because again, it's the fact that you're getting something. That's what the customer behavior is showing. It's not the fact of like, you're getting this much. Um, that's yeah. the thing to kind of think about. Yeah. It, it, uh, kind of related to that was we were like, how can we get more customers referring other customers? And we just sent out an email and said like, who are three people you would love to see using visible too? And we didn't even offer them anything. And we still got yeah. people referring, you know, well, kind of works like, for you really well because you, I'm assuming you can email the investor side. Um, and you can basically say like, Hey, you're using visible. You seem to like it. Like who, who else yeah. should use it? And you get some referrals, yeah. which is good. Uh, good question on value metrics. Um, you know, based on, on usage or, or value, how, what are best practices there if the customer wants more of a predictable cost though, right? Yeah. Like I don't want something bouncing up and down every month or every quarter. So, um, cause I have a budget. Yeah. So the, this is, this is more of a myth than not. It was okay. true. Don't get me wrong. It was very true. Like when SAS 1.0 was around and we started getting some like non licensed pricing, but it's a little bit less true now. And we kind of have like things like Salesforce and Slack and some other folks to kind of thank for that because it kind of acclimated some folks to up and down type pricing. But here, here's the thing. If you truly are hearing from more than five out of 10 customers that they need predictability and this is an issue, like truly hearing it, like I only have a hundred dollars to spend and anytime I go over a hundred, I'm going to get in trouble. So like I need it to be only a hundred. Then I would say like, you know, Bigger, figure out band pricing. And what I mean by that is like zero to 10 users is a hundred dollars, 11 mm -hmm. to 25 users is $200 and so on and so forth, because then you're not going to have like an up and down on a monthly basis. Um, but if you're not hearing that, like, don't worry about it until they get to yeah. an enterprise size contract. Now, if you get towards an enterprise size contract, what I really recommend is be like, spend the majority of your time trying to predict what the usage or what the value metric is going to be. Because it's, oh, and then even then undershoot. And this is the reason why is because if I sell you 10 million visits in a year, like for whatever my product is, and you only use 2 million, when it comes up for renewal, you're going to want a big discount. And I'm going to go, yeah, but I improved my product. And it's amazing. I want to charge more, right? But yeah. you missed it. So what I like to do is like, if you're doing some sort of longer term contract attached to a number, try to go under. And then if they blow through it in two months, then like you guys made a mistake and that's fine. But then go to them and say like, hey, you blew through this. Like we should probably like renegotiate. I don't want to charge you overages. Um, the era of overages is going away. Like it's it's customers are getting aggravated about it. Less and less people are using it. Um, you know, because it's it's more of a tax, but you can still put it in a contract as like, hey, I don't want to charge you overages. Like, let's figure out this contract. But if it's like they use everything up in nine months, I would use that as like, hey, don't worry about it. We're gonna be fine. Yeah, like, we'll let's you. talk yeah. in the renewal, that kind of thing. Um, and then you'll have better predictive data hopefully to then like you know yeah. charge them more next 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 quarter or next uh annual plan is basically last question do you have any insight on best approaches for customer feedback loops or product iteration that's a loaded question i think we could probably have uh, <laughs> a, a, a long conversation there um I, for for I'll, I'll just chime in and maybe you can you can yeah. add patrick but for for customer feedback loops i think it's it's just can we talk to, can we talk to a customer a day? I think like said something, I mm. mean, that sounds easy, but it's actually pretty hard. And, and we just went through this process where uh, Anna, one of our designers and myself are, are trying to talk to 30 customers in two weeks. Yeah. Um, it's actually a lot of work because you got to cut the list, email them, schedule all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, but I, you, you'll learn a lot just talking to customers. And I know that might sound insane to say uh, and obvious, but like the way they even talk about your product like yeah. they come, they'll, they'll name features for you because you'll hear the same thing over and over again um, and just listen to what they're saying. And then, you know, put that in the product, release it, get them, ping them again, say, hey, I would love to see you use it because that's another thing you'll learn. Like, hey, can we watch you use this feature? And then you'll, you'll hear and see um, where, you know, things work or, or don't work. Yeah, we, we wrote, <laughs> we've written a lot on customer development. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. No worries. We've written a lot on customer development, but I think that the thing you just pointed out there, I think is super important 
just put a number on the board. Mm-hmm. 30 day, 30 into 30 days, one a day, two a week, one survey a month, whatever it is, like just getting started. Because I think the, the talking to customers and doing research is not the path of least resistance for most folks. And it's because you either have this weird sense of like, you know, laziness, not laziness, but like, oh, I want to go do something else. Or you have this weird sense of like, you know, the crappy quote that actually isn't real. You know, if I asked them what they want, they would have said a faster Horace, you know, Henry Ford, like he never actually said this. Um, they've, they've debunked it, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> but the thing is, is like, you're not like that, that mis- the reason that misconception exists is because you're not trying to like get like, I'm not trying to ask you, Mike, like, what do you want? What should we build? Like, those are those are interesting questions, but they're the wrong types of questions. Instead, I want to be a prosecuting attorney, as they say. And I want to be like, hey, Mike, like, what? So you use ProfitWell. Like, what what were you doing right before you entered your, you know, the login screen? Like, what do you do? What, what were you doing? Like, what made you want to go in? Oh, well, I was doing this thing and like this other thing. And then I was like, oh, I can check that in profit. Like, and all of a sudden I'm learning, right? And then I'm going to filter all of that feedback. And then I'm going to go and basically, you know, try to make a decision and earn my paycheck. And I might do exactly the opposite of what Mike wants if he was very upfront with it, but that's my job. My job is to at least understand his hopes, dreams, pain points, wishes, all those other things. And then, you know, earn my paycheck and filter all that info. Yeah. Love it. That was a great way to wrap. Patrick, can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, We're really excited to be partnering with you guys and and that integration. We'll send this out to everyone with the recap and the recording. Uh, And again, feel free to email both of us if you have any questions. Uh, I can attest to this. Like Patrick, his email is public and he emails you back. So um, I take a minute. Don't, it's not going to be instant. I'm not going to give you an SLA for response time. Thank you. I appreciate Um, that. (laughs) But uh, thanks so much. And uh, we'll see everyone soon. All right. See you guys.